Mark 16. So I want you to listen carefully and listen well. Uh, not to Spencer crying, <laughs> but to the word of the Lord. Psalm 97, the Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad, let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. All who worship images are put to shame. Those who boast in idols worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and rejoices, and the villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, O Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Let those who love the Lord hate evil, for he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is shed upon the righteous, and joy on the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. So, uh, I want you to hear just a couple things within that. Um, first, uh, early on, you hear about the foes, God's foes, who, who melt away. Um, I want you to key in on the fact that we're worshiping here the, the Most High God, uh, that, that other God, gods are lesser gods. Now, interesting, um, the scriptures themselves say there, there are other gods, right? And so that would be another conversation to have. But the demonic powers, essentially, those um, angelic powers who have turned away from God, are then the foes of God. Uh, traditionally, we would say um, sin, death, and the devil, and the, and, and the uh, demonic hosts, are sort of the, the enemies or the foes of God. So I want you to notice that because in this next scripture reading, um, Paul is going to have... Um, some encounters with folks, but it's interesting to see what Christians who are under the reign of the Most High God, uh, it's interesting to see how they interact with people who you might think of as enemies. I want you to pay attention to how this unfolds. And it's okay, like, part of this first part is actually kind of funny. You know, there is some humor in the Bible time to time, and so, uh, yeah. So, so listen to this. Yeah, so here's, here's the context. Uh, so Paul... Um, you know, this is, this is Acts 16. So this is after Paul, who was persecuting Christians, has encountered Christ, has been converted, and uh, is now a missionary. And he's gone on several missionary journeys around sort of the, the Middle East area, uh, around the Mediterranean Sea. And he, what he does, he goes to a synagogue, a Jewish synagogue, and he tells the people in this city first about the Messiah, Jesus, who has come. And he's done that in a number of places. And um, most recently, since we have Lydia, uh, our own Lydia, we, we also can name just before this passage, uh, Paul, though the door was closed to him in one direction, God opened up a, a, a passageway into Macedonia, which is like Greece. Okay, so he, he goes island hopping across the Mediterranean and ends up in a, in a city called Philippi. So you heard the book of Philippians. So this is that place. And while he's there, he encounters Lydia, who's a seller of purple cloth. And he shares the gospel with her. And uh, she becomes a Christian, along with her whole household. And uh, becomes like a really important mission partner for Paul in, in Philippi. Um, interestingly, women in the early expansion of Christianity were probably the most important people. Um, Lydia, in particular, uh, is, is a wealthy person. She's a merchant. She sells purple cloth. That's like rich fabric. And so she offers up her own home for Paul and, and the Christian missionaries with him. Uh, and she welcomed, in fact, the whole church into her house. The, the church started as house churches before we had other buildings. And so Lydia had a house church for the Christians, the first Christians in Philippi. Now, after this encounter with Lydia, we move into our story today. And so uh, I invite you to listen carefully again. 
This is Acts chapter 16, um, verses 16 through 34. And the voice here is Luke. So we have a gospel of Luke. The same guy wrote the book of Acts. And this is a part of that, uh, that uh, recording when he was with Paul and was an eyewitness to these things. So when you hear we, that's Luke saying he was with Paul when this happened. Um, so as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order... He put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet into the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your whole household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced, along with his entire household, that he had believed in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing unto you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Um, so, I want you to see here at the beginning, um, I mean, it's kind of a funny story, right? I mean, Paul on this missionary journey, we think of Paul the Apostle as this you know, most, most holy man. Um, and so he's, he's going into the city, he's wanting to tell people about the resurrection of Jesus. And so, like, this girl, who is a servant, really, you can translate this as, as a slave girl. She was owned by these two merchants, um, began following them around and, and pointing to them and saying, these are servants of the Most High God who are announcing to you the way of salvation. And they just kept saying that. She kept saying that over and over and over and said, for many days... So can you imagine? These are servants of the Most High God, proclaiming to you the way of salvation. And then they would say, okay, and then they'd start talking. These are servants of the Most High God, proclaiming to you the way of salvation. And then, you know, another sideways glance and like, again, these are servants of the Most High God, proclaiming to you the way of salvation. It's amazing he lasted many days, isn't it? Yes. I, a man of great patience, apparently. And eventually, 
Paul has had enough, and I only said that three times. Can you imagine? Day. So Paul has had enough, and he turns and he casts out this spirit from this servant girl. Um, I want you to notice here that when Paul's proclaiming the kingdom, what's a kingdom? It's a domain where a king rules, right? So he's proclaiming the kingdom of God, which has come in Jesus Christ which identifies Jesus as the one who has conquered, Jesus as the one who is victorious over all that stands against us as, as human beings. So sin, death, and the demonic powers. Christ has been victorious. We see that in his resurrection, right? So the, the, the classic icon or image of, um, of the resurrection is Jesus having descended to Hades, the place of the dead. Uh, standing on the gates of hell, which he has trampled down, and holds the hands of Adam and Eve, or really the wrists, right? Because uh, he's pulling them up out of the grave. Uh, Satan, actually, is pictured as being underneath the doors. So Jesus is, is standing on the doors of hell. They're not on their hinges. He's standing on them. Satan's trapped underneath. He's defeated. And he is bringing them back to life as victorious over death, right? So uh, Adam and Eve have like their wrists are limp in the image because they're not doing anything to help pull themselves up. It is Christ who takes them and raises them up. And so the announcement of God's kingdom is that Jesus is the one who's victorious. And part of what Paul is doing is announcing this in word, just like the, the servant girl is saying, but also in deed. If it is true that Christ has conquered, so what does he do with this spirit who is somehow indwelling this girl and giving her um, a, a prophetic gift or, or power uh, from whom her owners are profiting? Does Paul condemn the girl who's annoying him? Does Paul condemn or destroy the person who stands before him? No. This is really important. He casts the demon out. He sees her, and he, it is not her that he is against. Yeah? It is those things that have taken control or power over her um, that he is getting rid of. Because in the kingdom that she is saying he's telling you about, the salvation that she's pointing to him and saying he knows the way of salvation, it comes to her, actually. Because even though she's a slave to these two men... She's now been set free from the, de the demon which had possessed her. Now this stands in opposition, right, to the two owners. And in fact, the authorities' um, response to Paul and to Silas and those who had come to announce the kingdom. Because when the kingdom comes, just as Jesus was persecuted, just as Jesus was condemned... When he was not only proclaiming repentantly the good news of the kingdom of God, which is at hand, he was also demonstrating it with acts of power as he too cast out demons, as he too healed those who were wounded or those who were um, uh, suffering from some malady. So just as Jesus was condemned, and notice the, notice the sequence. Falsely accused, arrested, stripped, beaten, imprisoned. That's what happened to Paul and Silas. It's also what happened to Jesus. Christians, to some degree, ought to expect this. Right? Um, and so, Paul is living out the same thing that happened to Christ. And you'll notice that when these rich merchants, uh, who, who had this servant girl and couldn't profit from her anymore, saw what Paul had done, what did they do? They went right after the person. They went right after, I mean, they, they, they beat him physically. They arrested him. They threw him in jail. They wanted to destroy him. They wanted to get rid of him. They wanted to wipe him off the face of the earth, right? Which is not what Paul did. Paul saw the servant girl and the image of God within her and, and directed his annoyance at the demon which had taken possession of her. Has anyone in this room ever been in conflict with anyone? <laughs> Laughter ensues, right? Right? Okay. Well, if so, here's a really important lesson. 
There are things in other people that will annoy you. If it happened to Paul, it'll happen to you. There are other things, there are things in other people that will rub you the wrong way. And there are also things in you that will not sit right with others. And sometimes these can be cast under the frame of like annoyance, right? Which doesn't seem as, as difficult to deal with. Aggravating, maybe. But sometimes there can be real enmity. So what I'm inviting you to see is how Christians are called to deal with others when they annoy you. And that is to see that they're made in the image of God. Perhaps they are plagued by things that are deeply worked into their being. Over time, uh, habits, tendencies, attitudes, beliefs, things that are distorting the image of God within them. Nevertheless, it is there. So I want you to be like Paul and not like the two merchants, which falsely condemn and only see the fact that Paul and Silas have taken, which imprison and strip and beat and try to destroy. The world, when it's an enmity, tries to destroy. Christians, when we recognize the enmity that can exist between each other, realizes that this is actually rooted in spirits and principalities and distorted images of God within a person, not who they truly are in Christ. So hold that tension in mind and recognize that, yeah, maybe sometimes we're, we're in conflict, right? And sometimes we see other people being on the end of that, but sometimes in a conflict we end up being the ones imprisoned. We end up being the ones who are tossed in jail. We end up being the ones who are hurt, right? And so that's, that's what happens with Paul and with Silas and also with Luke, who's with them. And so I want you to notice, what do they do while they're in jail? What do they do while they're imprisoned? What do they do when they're locked out from the world out there? You remember? They prayed and sang hymns, right? They worshiped. Not just when they came to church on Sunday morning, but when they were in the darkest place, when they were in the pit, you know, uh, being in prison, being, it, it said they were placed in the innermost prison, the darkest place, the deepest place, the most isolated place. This is where they went. They didn't know what was going to stand before them. They'd been beaten, you know, half to death. They were bloody bruised. They get tossed into jail. And then, to add insult to injury, they had their feet placed in the stocks, which is horribly uncomfortable. You know, you can go to like, um, colonial era, you know, recreated sites, and they've always got the stock sitting out front, you know, and the kids are like, ooh, that looks fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah but then you do it all night, and that's not fun. Um, it's it's, it's uh, pretty brutal. And yet, here they are at midnight. Literally, you know, it's dark. They're in their most prison. All the lights are out, and they're worshiping. So here's what I want you to see. That for the Christian, your external circumstances aren't ultimately determinative for you. That you can experience an inner freedom even when you are outwardly locked away. You can know Christ's victory in your life and live by that reality even when things outside are bleak. Even when things that surround you are difficult, torturous, brutal even. When it feels like the world is set against you. You can still have freedom. Even in prison. You know, Paul and Silas and, and Luke stand in a long line of biblical figures. Uh, of people with whom, who have found their way into the story of scripture. Who have ended up in the pit. And worshipped there. And then experienced freedom. Can you think of one? Daniel. Daniel. There it is on my list. Yeah, awesome. Good, Marilyn. Thank you. Yeah, where did Daniel go? Into the lion's den. Yeah? And literally he was thrown down into the pit. 
overnight where he was supposed to have been destroyed because he was worshiping the Most High God, right? These themes keep coming up. And he wouldn't worship the false gods, the lesser gods, the, the demonic beings. Worshiped only the true God. And so he was condemned for it. And he was imprisoned for it. And they tried to destroy him for it. And he found his way into the pit. And he worshiped and he prayed all night. And when they opened up the pit the next day, there he was alive. You know, uh, maybe a month ago, the kids did Daniel and Lion's Den in Sunday school. And so they had a cave, and they were inflatable. They were sort of like tigers, but they were lions, I think. Uh, yeah, so the kids were like physically acting this out in Sunday school. Um, Joseph is another. Joseph, his brothers condemned him and tried to get rid of him and threw him into the pit, barely escaping being murdered by his own family. And he's sold into slavery. He spends years, in one sense, in the pit, imprisoned in Egypt. But he's faithful to the Lord. He continues to see these, these visions that God gives him. And eventually is raised up. Not for his own sake, but for the sake of others. Um, Jonah. Jonah, right? Swallowed up. He was in some disobedience, so it's not like a strict... Uh, one to one comparison here, but he was living in disobedience. He was swallowed up. He was taken down into the depths of the sea, which represent chaos, and swallowed up in the be belly of the fish. Um, and the description is, a, is of him going into Hades. It says the uh, the roots of the mountains and the, and the uh, weed seaweed had wrapped around his head and pulled him all the way down to the bottom. And it's at that point he repents. He prays. He worships even in the darkest place, even in the place where he's trapped, and he experiences freedom. Even there, at the bottom of the ocean, in a fish, whether the, you know if this story is like a, a literal one or a, or a symbolic one, I wasn't there. I think either can apply, right? Either are possible. But even in this place, Jonah prays and worships and experiences freedom. And there's this guy named Jesus, right? Who was falsely accused. Who was arrested, who was stripped, who was beaten, who was mocked, who was condemned to death, who went into Hades himself, truly was placed in the tomb, the stone rolled shut, right? And yet who emerges victorious. So what happens to Paul and Silas? As they experience an inner freedom it becomes matched by an external one, doesn't it? Uh, the walls begin to shake. An earthquake hits. Um, you know what? You know, I, the miraculous occurs. Uh, when I was in Israel last year, I got to go into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where, uh, which covers over now the place where Jesus was crucified. And, you know, at the time of Christ's crucifixion, there was an earthquake. Um, it says it in Scripture. And you can see... In the rock, which is exposed inside the church, uh, a split where, where it has split, and they've had folks come in, and geologists come in, and kind of check how they check these things, and they it's dated to you know like around the one year or the first uh, century you know of Christ, um, and this crack runs in different places. Uh, you can see that the effects of it not just in this one instance but others. Um, so yeah, the miraculous does, does happen, and it happens for Paul, and they're set free, their chains are broken, they're, they're loose. Um, and then the, the craziest part, maybe the greater miracle occurs, not that there was an earthquake that set them free and opened the doors and their chains fell off. The greater miracle is that when the guard woke up, Paul and Silas were still there. Can you imagine? In the darkest, deepest place that you've been, don't just think about a prison, but think about the places of greatest struggle where you've been. If the door was open and you could have walked out, oh my goodness, would you not have wanted to walk out right then? Get free, get out in the open air where the, where the light shines brightly and you know and experience freedom and not the suffering that you have been enduring. Of course. And yet Paul and Silas, that's what we would have done for us, for myself, but Paul and Silas aren't 
concerned first about themselves. They're concerned about serving God. What are God's purposes here? Why has God set us free? And so they stay. And the jailer is ready because in those days, if, if, if prisoners had escaped, right, they, you know, they, just, they just killed the guard. Maybe they torture him beforehand. Uh, and so this is the easy way out and sort of the honorable way out for him, he thinks. But when Paul sees him take his sword, he says, no, don't do that. We are still here. And the guard's amazed, and he says, bring the light. And literally the light comes and shines in the darkness, and they're God's servants, right? So they bring the lamps, and here's the light, and there's the servants of God. And he falls at their feet because he's heard them worshiping during the night. He's heard them praying in the place of deep suffering. And he says, what should I do to be saved? It is not Paul's rational arguments which talked him into converting to coming to give his life over to Christ. It wasn't even, in fact, the, his, his worship alone. But it was the fact that he was so oriented to God's rule, God's purpose, God's kingdom. What does God have for me in this situation? He didn't see his suffering as completely opposed to what God wants to accomplish in the world. And so he gives himself over to this servant or to this jailer. He blesses him, he baptizes him, they go home. His whole household comes to know the Lord. It's a, I mean, it's a crazy story, honestly. Um, and it could be your story, is the, is the thing. It can be our story. Um, that God can take even the difficult things we go through, even the unjust things we go through, even the, the prisons that we uh, find ourselves held captive within. He can take those things and when we worship, we can experience freedom that doesn't care ultimately about our external circumstances, but finds its purposes in God and God's will and the, the expansion of God's kingdom. Um, so I hope that for you. I hope that for us. Um, I mean, that's what it's all about. I hope that maybe one day, you know, we could write a story of our lives together and it would sound a whole lot like the scriptures. Because it's the same Lord, it's the same Spirit, and it's the same call to sacrificial love that we've been given. And when we do that, God does great things through us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. When you worship God, it frees you to see others as created in God's image, and to treat them as such, even when they're annoying. And when you live in this way, the kingdom comes. And there's much freedom and joy and light to be found. So we worship this morning. I pray, you know, your, your vision and hopefully mine continues to be sharpened. That we can see each other as God sees us. Um, so now we get to go and love. So I send you to that work. And I uh, pray that the hands of Christ would tend your wounds. And the Holy Spirit will bring to mind just the things that you need to hear. I pray that you would rest assured that the Father will raise you up to his everlasting arms at the last. Amen.